welcome out to another one of our Bible Facts video ministries. We're trying to replace what we've been doing in the Journal Pioneer newspaper by a series of articles for quite a number of years now. And because of the situation, as you all know, the two newspapers had combined because of circumstances over the present coronavirus pandemic. And so there hasn't been room for my articles anymore. So I'm going to this format and I'm trying to again use the same principles of informing people, letting people know what the Bible teaches so that they will be able to be properly prepared to be able to make right decisions about things that the Bible deals with. And today um, our study has to do with the Good Friday theme, the Good Friday celebration. And I want to start by reading a passage in John chapter 19 that's appropriate for that. It's in John chapter 19 and verses 16 to 18. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which was called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. So that's John chapter 19 from verse 16 down to verse 19. Many messages on this passage and on the related passage in other of the four Gospels have been delivered over the years, centering around a theme that's based on the scene that's there where you have Jesus in the center cross and you'll have on either side of him a thief on another cross and so you may have heard that kind of outline in the past the three crosses and the kind of lessons we can learn by comparing them and we want to do a little bit of that again today now there's a number of ways that we learn the bible in fact teaches us to study it and how to profit from it so we're going to look at those three crosses and compare them a little bit we're going to look at the persons on them as well and compare them a little bit and understand what is going on, what the message and what the transactions is taking place at this time. Now, in fact, that's a, that's a basic um, principle of studying the Bible. Many times we, are, we learn by comparison. We put two things side by side that are often together there in the text, maybe two individuals or two circumstances, and by comparing the one with the other, we learn. It kind of brings into highlight the truths that we want to, want to learn. Now, as far as the crosses go, the cross was an instrument of the Roman legal system. And in the scriptures, especially in particularly the New Testament, the Roman legal system was, was featured as a backdrop or a uh, illustration or a mirror of God's legal system, which is the one that matters most of all. And so as we consider the Roman legal system, it casts a shadow by which you can discern the forms of God's way of dealing and God does have a definite legal side to his dealings. God is he is the judge and that in itself suggests he's the lawmaker and those things suggest very much a legal context and that helps us. I'm not saying that it's everything in understanding about God but it is a very important in fact it's a fundamental theme of understanding how God deals with us. And so especially in the book of Romans in the New Testament we see this backdrop of the Roman legal system and teaching us about God's dealings. Now, in so, so in this passage, our kind of our framework is the three crosses, but I want to think of it also from the perspective of that legal system. And we can think of four basic phases that take place. They're not all that different from what we see today in our legal system, but we'll see four phases and we want to kind of trace through them for these three persons that are involved here and what we learn from what they went through in it and what they have to teach us by sometimes by surprise uh, about God's own way of dealing. And before we do that, we're going to, as we always do, bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you show us and bring light to us in such a clear way. We thank you for the story of the cross. We thank you for the event that took place there about 2,000 years ago when your son uh, stood in our place and paid for our sins. Help us to understand the lessons that are presented here through this study today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the fourth, the, really the, the first of the four phases would be accusation. It's like today. Um, somebody goes to the authorities and says, this person hurt me or robbed me or whatever. And so that's the beginning of the four phases uh, <coughs> that put the legal processes into motion, uh, accusations or indictments. 
So we can think here first about the, the two thieves. Now we don't know the story about their being accused, but it's obviously obviously something that happened. And as I mentioned, the different the four different gospels have parallel accounts about many of the things that we read of here in John's gospel and in Matthew's gospel. It's clear in telling us what the accusation was uh, against these people, why they were considered criminals by Rome. So Matthew 27, verse 38, it says. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. So the accusation against them was theft, and apparently in a very serious context to bring the death penalty upon them. Um, then, uh, then consider the accusation that was against Jesus. Here was somebody also being dealt with by the Roman legal system in the middle cross, and in that same chapter, in Matthew chapter 27, it tells us about his accusation. The next verse says, uh, or sorry, the verse before in Matthew 27, 37, it says, And set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now, um, that might seem like a funny accusation, but I suppose uh, to the minds of the ones that were accusing him and wanting him to be crucified, they um, that, that was in a sense what they were accusing him of, of claiming to be. And that's the way Pilate wrote it, for reasons I don't have time to go into, perhaps in this, in this little study. But that was the accusation against him. He was the king of the Jews. And then at the same time, and because of this parallel that exists between what the Roman legal system was doing and the much bigger and more important picture about God's legal system, we could consider a little bit about God's legal administration in the same picture. First of all, again, with the two thieves. Those two thieves were... Um, Perfect examples of all humanity. Each of them, they were the same in that regard. They were both accused by Rome of being thieves, and they would both have been people that have been would have been um, accused of crimes in God's legal administration because we're all sinners. So in that matter, their picture of us, the thieves, picture each one of us, no matter who we are or what kind of religious background we have. God charges the whole human race with sinfulness and with specific sins. One of the key passages on this, again in the book of Romans in the early chapters of it, gives one of those lists that the Apostle Paul liked to make in his writings, and he lists a large grouping there of sins that humanity is guilty of. It says in Romans 1 verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, Debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. So that's quite a list of uh, crimes, and then, and then he adds this at the end of it, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So it's saying people do those things even though they know it's wrong and they take pleasure in the whole process and in others doing them as well in, in various ways. But here's one of the dividing points between the people that are part of the scene. Jesus had no accusation against him. Never throughout his whole life. And he could face people, as you can see if you turn to John chapter 8, he could say, which of you convinces me of sin? And there was never a proper accusation. The accusations even that were brought against him by the Jews was of blasphemy because he said he was God. But of course, since he was God, it wasn't blasphemy. And nobody ever dared accuse him of anything else. They could never, there was nothing he ever did. They didn't accuse him of these kinds of things. Um, you know, fornication or theft or anything like that. That wasn't, you never hear once of those kinds of accusations. And so Jesus was not. He wasn't accused by the, even the Roman legal system of that. And he certainly wasn't ac accused by God of those things. Um, so, the difference between these two persons or group, and this person or group of persons between Jesus and the two thieves, in their life and their actions, stemmed out of what they were in their nature. The two thieves were born sinners. Jesus was not. Jesus was born by a special, miraculous work of God, and this is one of the key fundamentals of the Christian message. Certain things are fundamental doctrines of Christianity and without them you, you wouldn't have the Christian message. 
and, part, and, and by that I mean who Jesus Christ is and, and um, his, the, the details of his birth and his coming into the human, into the human race. So in Luke chapter 1, and I'm springing back here between different passages and not getting the right one. In Luke chapter 1, when the angel came to Mary to explain her pregnancy, that she couldn't figure it out because she knew she hadn't had relationships with a man, and the angel explained to her that she was going to have a very unique person. It would be God manifest in the flesh. He would be born by a miracle of the virgin birth. So in Luke 1, again in verse 35, and the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So be, this is before she was pregnant, obviously, but it, she, she was getting explained to her. So when it happened, she'd be ready for it. And she, and she asked herself in the previous verse, how, how shall this be, saying, I know not a man? And the angel said, This is going to be a miraculous thing. And the one that's going to be born of you isn't going to have a human father. It's going to be the incarnation of God, it will be God manifest in human flesh. So, accusations begin the legal process. Secondly, there is the trial. And so that's the way it is today. You can't just accuse somebody and send them off to jail on an accusation. We have due process of law. And so there is a hearing, there is a trial, there is the opportunity to present evidence, to present arguments. And with the case of the thieves, again, we don't have the record of it, but we know the Roman legal system, and they would have no doubt gone through those steps, would have been charged with these crimes, they would have been evidence brought, and they would have been found to have been guilty. But the thing I want to um, think on as we think about this stage of it is how it applies to us. That God also has brought charges against us, and then he's gone to the point of bringing argumentation. He's acted um, so that we'll understand our guilt, and we won't pretend that we didn't do anything. So when a person goes to court, he may say, I didn't do anything, do anything. But once he stands before the judge and he's examined and maybe cross-examined and evidence is brought, it's brought primarily for the sake, of course, of showing the court that he's guilty. But in the case of, in the case of our sinfulness, God brings it to us, first of all, so that, first of all, we would understand our sin problem and, and be able to make make provisions for it to, to deal with it. God has provided a way of, of taking care of our sin problem, but if we don't know we're sinners, we won't do it. We won't care to. So again, the early chapters of Romans, in this chapter, Paul has been considered, and Paul wrote the book of Romans, he's been considered to be like a prosecuting attorney. So it's again, it's a courtroom scene, and God has really the whole human race as the defendant, defendants, and the Apostle Paul is acting, as God directs him, to be a kind of a prosecuting attorney to show people that they're sinners. In that chapter 1, that's where I got that list of sins before. A couple other things I want you to notice in it. He also removes excuse. And so in verses 18 down to verse 20, one of the things that people will claim to say, well, they'll, they'll try to escape the sin accusation. They'll basically say there's no God. I mean, atheism is just an obvious attempt to deny sinfulness. But this is part of the argument here, and he's saying you can't do that because everybody knows there's a God. And this is his reasoning. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. And what he's saying is to claim to be an atheist or claim there's no God is a suppression of truth. Now, there's not, there's not really an, it's not really an acceptable argument from I understand, in our laws, ignorance is no excuse of the law. But he's saying here, you don't even have ignorance. You know that there's a God that you have to answer to. And he gives the reason, and he says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. And when he says in them, it means in their midst. So God has given us a universe of evidence that the human race has to know certain things about him, because we learn certain things about him as the Creator. For to, to be a creator, he had to be infinitely wise, he had to be infinitely powerful, he had to be these kinds of things, and a God of goodness. And God says that evidence is before everybody, because we're all in the midst of his creation. So he says that which may be known of God is manifest in them. It's like, it's like the attorney has come and brought all these, all these um, 
pieces of evidence, and, and they're countless. They're countless, and you can't just refuse to recognize them. You have to face them. It goes on to say, for the invisible things of him, that means the part of God's nature that you, you can't see. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth, so you can't see God with your physical eye. It says, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So it, it said you can't, you can't miss it. You can't say, well, I don't understand how there can be any kind of creator when you're in the midst of his creation. You can't say, I don't understand how God is infinitely wise when you look at the wisdom manifested in the designs that he's, that he's created and the systems that he's created. It's, it just speaks for itself. And then it says not only being seen, but it says but being understood by the things that are made. So by looking at the things that are made, we understand something of God's capacity and, and character and attributes. And then it says, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they were without excuse. So when we look at a world, we know this world didn't exist forever. Nobody, I don't even think the most atheistic scientist in the world believes it existed forever. They know that it had a time span because they know it's winding down, and since it's winding down, it had to have a beginning. Um, that's, just, that's just a self-evident truth. So we know that as in all things in the world we see, if we see anything evidencing design, we know intuitively it's in our nature. We have, a, we have a, an intuition, we have a, a rational nature that teaches us that things have a cause, cause and effect. And we'd never claim there was no creator if we saw anything man-made, so what right would we have to say there's no creator if we see things that God made? It's irrational. We know it had to have a, something had to create it. And it says his eternal power. And people say, well, if it's if cause and effect is a law, well then, oh, who made God? And that's that's not a rational argument. That's just another, that's uh, just another attempt to evade the truth. We know that things that are temporal had a creator, and reason tells us that you can't just keep going back and back and back and back like that. You have to start with something that's eternal. The eternal thing has no creation, and it must be the ultimate cause of that which is temporal. So that's why it's, it says there, even his eternal power and Godhead. So we know about the deity of God, we know about his eternity, we know about his infinite power, and everybody knows that. So this and a number of other rationales that are found there in those chapters show on, 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 the, on behalf of, well, this Paul acting as a, as a prosecuting attorney, he's saying that there's no excuse. And so it says in that verse again, so that they are without excuse. In the verse we already saw in verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but um, have pleasure in them that do them. And so the next phrase says, therefore thou art inexcusable. Inexcusable. If you do something you know is wrong, there's no excuse. So God goes through these arguments and reasonings, and he shows whether the person is just given to wickedness, or whether he's a self-righteous person. Everybody's a sinner. To, to point a finger at somebody else and accuse that person of doing something wrong doesn't excuse you. So all these arguments are brought, and in the, in the end, you get to chapter 3, and there's kind of a summary there. In verses 9 to 20, it's kind of like the final remarks, the concluding remarks of the prosecuting attorney. And he says, What then? Are we better than they? No, and no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. So he says, We've proved it. We've proved it, that everybody is under this, in a sinful state. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And he continues on down through and talks about the various ways that sin has manifested, manifested itself. It says their throat is an open sepulcher. So people in their speech, the primary proof, people are sinners, the way they talk. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And then it talks about the road they walk. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In other words, people are violent and oppressive. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace, have they not known? There's no fear of God before their eyes. That's ungodliness. People living as if there's no God. And God takes note of it all. And then he makes this statement. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So God does all this and he writes these things in his word to show us that we're all guilty. In other words, we stand there condemned before the judgment bar. So we see the accusation, 
we see the trial and the evidence, and interestingly here as well, Jesus was also tried. And those of you that know your Bibles will realize that he stood before, well, it was, it was more than one aspect of his trial, but in, in regard to the uh, final aspect of his cruci crucifixion, it was in the power of the Roman authorities, and so he, he was tried before Pilate, the Roman governor. And of course the people accused him falsely, and again, the length of this time here doesn't allow for a whole lot of quoting and, and, and so on, but they could find nothing really genuine against him. They could find they could find none of those lists of sins that you find in the Bible against him. And so Jesus was sub subjected to a trying of a sense. And he, in a sense, his, his whole life of ministry was a trial in the sense that God allowed him to live and walk among people and show who he was. So the people that knew him the closest, the people that are closest to us will know most about our failings. But his disciples never accused him of anything. The people around about him, they couldn't find anything. They would make false accusations, but they, there, was no, there was no evidence. There was nothing there that could be brought against him. So again, we have the accusation, we have the trial. And then thirdly, when this is all done, the process are all done, comes, comes the sentence. So this is the time for the defendant to receive what we would call his official, official reckoning. How is the state going to regard him? That's the sentence. And in the sentence, the judge either says, the state recognizes you as being innocent, or uh, we would say righteous, or else the state regards you as being guilty. That's the sentence, that's the, the regard, that's how the state considers you, and how it determines how it's going to deal with you. Now, for the sake of the thieves, they're a perfect demonstration of what comes when you're accused and then you're, you're tried and convicted. That sentence is called condemnation. So, in the Roman courts, when a person was found guilty, he was condemned. He was pronounced to be guilty and that he would have to pay the penalty that was matched to that crime. And so, what the thieves there went through was, again, a picture of our spiritual condition as each one of us. Our natural condition is that of being sinners. We're like those thieves. We have a sinful nature, and it's shown itself in many countless sinful acts. And then that makes us condemned before God. God's Word reveals our behavior, and we are condemned. And so, again, in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, Read those two verses. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. So in other words, the Bible was written so that everybody, everybody's mouth may be stopped. That is, it would, it's such a compelling testimony of our sin in the Bible that it leaves us where we have nothing to say. Our mouths are stopped. We can't say, oh yeah, but, or I'm not that bad. It, it just it shows us what we are. And he said that was written that all the world might become guilty. So part of the purpose of the Bible is to show us our guilt. He says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So when you compare our actions and look at the life, the life record and the behavior of all of us, there's nobody that can stand before God's court, God in his, in his judgment seat, as it were, and think that he's going to be pronounced um, just. He's not going to be pronounced just. He's going to be condemned. And the thing that people need to understand about this, this isn't something that waits until some imaginary day when people stand before God and some imaginary scales are brought out and hoping the good outweighs the bad and all that sort of thing. It's true right now. So in John chapter 3, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. It says, But the wrath of God abideth on him. And it says in another passage that we are condemned already. We are condemned already. That's our, that's our status. Without salvation, without having our sin problem taken care of by God, this is our state. We're just like those two thieves were there. Um, it's fascinating to notice that when Jesus was tried in that Roman trial, he wasn't condemned even by the, even by the Roman court. And when he stood before Pilate, and I'll turn over to the, the record of it in Luke, Luke's Gospel in chapter 23, he was repeatedly, I'll just I'll read a couple of verses here, he was repeatedly declared not to be guilty by the judge. Luke 23, 14. And said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that 
perverteth the people, and behold, I have examined him before you, and have found no fault in this man, touching those things wherever you accuse him. This is Potus speaking to his accusers, and he says, no, nope, he didn't do those things. He, he's not guilty. He says, I found no fault. Then in verse 15, no, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. He says, in fact, not just me, but I've sent him also to another Roman authority, Herod. And he says, no, nope, he, he couldn't find anything wrong with him either. And then down verses 21 and 22, And they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. Now, God ordained this as a testimony. Many of the things in the, in the Scripture, well, the whole of the Bible is a testimony of God's Son. It's messianic in nature. It's, it's, a, it's the book of Jesus Christ, even in the Old Testament where they anticipate his coming and give us pictures of him before his coming. So the whole book is a testimony of Jesus Christ, and the records there are testimonies to help us understand we can't live there, we're not there, and like in many areas of life, we have to receive the testimonies of others. And so God has given his testimonies in his word, and part of it is by having it so work out that that Roman ruler would himself be part of it, and would say, no, he didn't do anything wrong. So we've seen the accusation, the trial, and the sentence for those three persons that are there on those three crosses. And of course, in the case of Jesus, it's, it's strange that he should be pronounced righteous, innocent. But when we get to the final part of it, they're all three partaking in this at the hand of Rome as well. They were all punished. So the thieves, they got what you would expect them to get. They no doubt were guilty. And then once they were accused, once they were tried, and then they were sentenced, well, the last thing is the punishment to be meted out. And so they were hung on a cross. And this is, again, the picture of the penalty which is due to sinners. If nothing is done for us, then we also will fall under the judgment of God when we think of God's administration. And it's an appropriate picture as well because the, sin, the penalty for sin is the death penalty. And the Bible says that has two aspects. It starts with the physical death, but more importantly, in what calls what's called the second death, when in the last very last days, when all all people stand before all unsaved people stand before God at the great white throne, it says He'll cast those that did not know Him into the lake of fire to be to tormented forever. That's the second death. In the case of Jesus, it's a great mystery, because we just looked at His sentence. And we saw that the judge said over and over, no, he didn't do anything wrong. No, he didn't do anything wrong. He was innocent. I find no fault in him. But we know that despite this, to please the crowd, Pontius Pilate did have him crucified. And so this is a great, mis this is a great mystery. We say, well, what's the connection? And again, it's going to teach us something about God's dealing, but it's not going to be about God's dealing just of his law but there's going to be something else we're going to learn about God from this, from this consideration. And it's at this point when we consider this last aspect of the law, the penalty side of it, in which the mysteries are cleared up and, and everything comes together. So let's look at, in this, in this event, we have to consider the two thieves separately. Up to this point, they were both guilty. Apparently, they'd both done it, they'd both been accused, they'd both been tried, they'd both been found guilty and they were both crucified. That's the Roman administration of law. But the anomalies, or the mysteries that are part of the process here, are, are there, so we'll see the difference. We say, wait a minute, there's something different between the way the Romans did things and the way God does things. Some things to be learned by direct parallel, and some things to be learned by contrast. So, as I said, when we understand what God is doing here, the whole all these mysteries makes sense, and God, it's God's administration makes sense. So, part of the mystery is not just what happened to Jesus, but when we look again at the, at, the, at the administration of God, we learn something very unusual here, from a human standpoint, for how God deals with one of those thieves. So, in Luke chapter 23 again, in verse 40, it says, and the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? I should read the reverse before. So the two thieves here, they're called malefactors. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. And so one of the thieves on one side, he's, he's railing on the Lord Jesus and saying, If you're really Christ, get us out of here. 
But says, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly? So notice this thief, even though he was guilty and had committed these crimes, he had come to the point where he acknowledged it. And he said, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And he didn't just see he was guilty, he saw something else. He, inter he rebuked this other thief for, for railing on and he said, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. So he's saying, Rome had every right to do this to me because of what I did. I, I'm getting my just desserts. But then he said, um, but this man hath done nothing amiss. So he recognized something else. He recognized the special character of the one that was in the middle cross. And he said, this, this one's being crucified even though he hasn't committed any crimes. He's being sentenced to death even though he hasn't done anything wrong. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So he could see his time was up in the Roman kingdom. And he recognized something about the one in the middle cross. And he looked to him for salvation. He wanted to be a part of that kingdom. And so he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And we see that Jesus accepted him. It says, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He said, okay, I'll accept you, all right. You're going to die today, and then you're going to be with me in paradise. So that comes across maybe as an anomaly. We've been thinking about God having a righteous administration. God's a judge. He keeps track of sins. He punishes sins. But here's someone that's not being punished. He's going to paradise instead of to hell. And that's, so, so we see a difference between the Roman administration and God's administration. In the Roman administration, the two thieves were killed. In God's administration, this thief, he's let go free. He's brought into God's family. He's taken to be part of the kingdom of God, and he's promised a place in paradise. Well, how can that be? Well, that, that can only be as we understand and we think about Jesus and what was happening to him. In the Roman administration, he was being unjustly punished. He was being given a death sentence for a crime he hadn't done. And you know, in God's administration, that was a peril, that was a shadow, that was a picture of what was happening in God's administration. And that is because God in his eternal salvation plan for the human race, for all that would believe in him, this is his eternal plan that his own son would, be, would come into the human family, would be born into the human race, would live a perfect life, would minister for a number of years, and would ultimately go to the cross and on the cross would give up his life as a payment for the sins of others. There's no other explanation. Just as Pilate said, I find no fault in him, it's absolutely true. There was nothing wrong with him. Jesus could look his, uh, his critics in the eye throughout his life and say, which of you convinces me of sin? God in heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So testimony after testimony was there that he had never done sin, but he was dying the sinner's death. He was numbered among the transgressors. So the transgressors, the lawbreakers, were getting this crime, and he was numbered among them in that he was sharing the same place of punishment. He was sharing the same penalty. How do you understand this? Well, when you look at the fact that one of those thieves was being forgiven, then we understand. Jesus was bearing his sin. He, Jesus was being punished not just by the Romans, but he was in, a, in, in the economy of God, he was bearing the penalty for that man's sins. So those three crosses are very significant. Somebody has said one time that in both of the thieves, there was sin in them. They were sinners. In Jesus, there was no sin in him. In one of the thieves, the one who rejected the Lord and apparently died in his sins, that thief died with sin on him, and that means that means that just as Rome had reckoned his sin on him and so had punished him, so would God. He would he would die. He committed the sins, but he would be regarded as a sinner in God's sight and would die and go to go to judgment. Whereas the one who received Christ, he would sin in him, but he had no sin on him in the sense that God didn't God didn't um, impute sin upon him. He didn't reckon him to be a sinner, but he accepted him as righteous. Why, how could that be? It was because of the, the middle cross where the one had no sin in him, but he had sin on him. That is, he bore our sins. His sins were, our sins were laid upon him. And that's the explanation of that scene there. And there are many verses in the New Testament that testify to this. In other words, this is not a difficult or a complicated thing. 
even though surprisingly many many even even um, groups that call themselves Christian no longer proclaim it and don't even believe it. It's not hard to find in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I'm just giving a couple selections. We could turn to other ones in Romans again. Uh, I like the ones in Peter. Peter liked to dwell on this theme in a number of the passages in, in his epistle. In 1 Peter 3 and verse uh, 18 it says, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, and then it says the just for the unjust. So yeah, he was paying for sins, all right, when he died, but he was just, he was paying for the sins of the unjust, and that's sinners. It says in 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. This was a substitutionary sacrifice. All the animal sacrifices that had been offered in the Old Testament were picturing and anticipating this time. And so, uh, as, a, as a testimony of God's way of salvation in the Old Testament, an animal sacrifice would die um, as, a, as a testimony of the faith of that per person that he believed in substitutionary sacrifice. But the ultimate fulfillment of it, where sins, an animal couldn't really bear the sins of a man. Only one person could do this. He had to be a man, but he also had to be God, and that's Jesus Christ. He was the God-man, man and God in one perfect person who lived the perfect life, sinless life, and then he died. God manifest in the flesh, paid the price for our sins, died in our place on the cross. And so it's important to notice that. That thief understood that. The thief that was saved understood that. He said, he said, I'm guilty. I'm getting what I deserve. And that's part of salvation, understanding you're a sinner. If you don't understand it, you're not going to go to Christ. You're not going to be able to trust Christ for salvation if you don't think you're a sinner. Now it's, it's difficult. It's a difficult, it's a hard time to come to grips with the fact that you're a sinner and that you stand condemned by God, but you have to do it. It's not easy for anybody. But it's no solution to pretend it's not true or try to drown your sorrows and drink or something like that. You have to face it. He faced it, and then he said, there's something going on here. This guy didn't sin. This one in the middle didn't sin. This is the Messiah. He didn't sin. He's dying. And so he was able to, he, 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 had, he had boldness to go to him and say, why don't you save me? And I think he got a glimpse of the fact that this person in the middle cross, the Lord Jesus, was dying in his place. Sadly, there was another person that was there, the other thief, and he rejected it. So this benefit didn't come to him. We don't read anything about him, um, we don't read anything about him having any hope of dying and going to paradise. He died in his sins. And the Bible tells us there is a hereafter. The Bible says, it's appointed on a man once to die after death, the judgment. So people are going to face God in regard to their sins after this life. I want to close with one verse in Isaiah 53. This whole chapter is a wonderful chapter for a Good Friday message. But it says in Isaiah 53 and in verse 5 it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. This is an Old Testament prophecy anticipating the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ on the cross. It says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. So he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And so it's through that payment and his shed blood on the cross that we have eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And he, of course, went on to rise from the dead, and he lives today, and that's part of the Easter message as well. He lives, and he lives as a Savior to come and have a relationship with all the trust in him and his finished work on the cross. So I trust that will help people in decisions, because everybody needs to make that decision. Everybody has to go to God and deal with God about what Christ has done for them. Everybody has to personally call upon the name of the Lord to come to Him and receive from Him by saying, yes, I am that sinner that you speak about in the Bible, that's me, but I don't want to go down that road. I want to become a Christian. I want to be born again. I want to have eternal life. And the Bible promises that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that can be anyone's. It's there. You have the right to call upon Him personally. Thank you.